hermetic call from out of the past. Stories, strange and weird. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Stories of the supernatural, the supernormal, dramatized by fact, the mystery, the unknown. We tell you this frankly, so if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these magnetic plays, we urge you calmly and sincerely to turn off your radio now. Welcome back to The Horror. Thanks for joining me this Saturday. We're going to hear from Beyond Midnight this week, a South African series that aired from November of 1968 to April of 1970, produced 78 episodes. Our story today is Short Circuit. This one first aired January 3rd, 1969. It isn't only the ghouls, the vampire, the undead dead, the scream in the night, or similar shots of fear selected from the quiver of horror that spellbind the listener and fascinate the casual turner on of a radio switch. In this tale, there is nothing outwardly ghostly. It is a story of unease, and we challenge you to make your radio set silent without listening all the way to Short Circuit. Desolate. Yes, Mr. Fosberger. Though, mind you, at this time of year, I mean, when, when spring comes and the, and the trees are... I'm sorry, desolate. Why do you imagine I bought 100 acres of ground on which to build a house? Yes, of course, Mr. Fosberger. I want desolation and privacy and security. I can afford to get what I want. Then, let's take a look at the house. And the two men, Mason and Fosberger, walked towards the building. The two men walked, each bent unknowingly upon his own individual journey beyond midnight. was completed about three weeks ago. Since then, the engineers have been installing and testing the electrical circuits. The final tests were only made yesterday. And the builders? Oh, they were flown back to the continent immediately. The danger of information leaking out is remote. <coughs> Shall we go in, uh, Mr. Fassberger? Mm. Uh, now, to all intents and purposes, this lock is an ordinary lock with an ordinary key, Mr. Fassberger. Nobody would suspect that the tumblers are actuated by coded magnets in the key and that they, in turn, operate six electronic locks, uh, which are built into the door and quite inaccessible. Laminated steel, you see? Like, like the walls and floors. It's got an armor-piercing shell. Good. Not, not just a globe or a collection of globes. Exact to your specification. Mm. Naturally, it'll look better with furniture and in about nine months' time when the decorations are complete. Yes, 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 yes. yes. The, 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 the windows are deceptive, aren't they? You, you'd never imagine there'd be space for steel shutters to glide across. And you see, yes, the glass is polarized. You can see out, but nobody can see in. And all the windows are the same. Exactly. The, the whole house was built as a precision engineering job. Mm. The moment someone tries to tamper with the windows or the outside doors, the whole of the engineering electronic gadgetry comes into play. The house is completely sealed off from the rest of the world. A steel fortress. Fast dagger fortress. Impenetrable. Impregnable. 
The main electricity supply for the whole house comes in here. That black box carries the power supply to use it. But naturally, it's sealed, and only the company's electricians can open it. But every other room in the house is individually fused, so nothing can go wrong, you see. But now there is an emergency diesel generator in an outhouse at the back. So in the event of a power failure, you can generate your own electricity. We've thought of everything. I hope so. The place is costing me nearly 250000 I want perfection. Oh, you're, you're getting it. Now, if you care to go into the next room and watch the window, I'll, I'll just show you how rapidly and efficiently the steel shutters slide across. Then afterwards, I'll go outside and pretend to be a burglar. Very well. Fassberger stood by the horizontal window and fingered the edge of the steel frame with his pointy fingers. The big diamond ring in its fleshy platinum setting glittered richly in the subdued daylight. Ready? Yes. It happened so suddenly that his eyes were completely deceived. One minute there was a window looking out on bare, bleak countryside. Next instant the window had gone, and in its place was a sheet of blue-gray steel. Curiously, there was an agonizing pain in the middle of his right hand. Even more frightening, the hand suddenly seemed to have become immovably attached to the window frame. Mason! Mason! I think it's one of the fuses has blown up. Uh, Open the shutter, oh, man. Can't you see my hand caught in the thing? It caught my ring. Might have lost my hand if it hadn't been for the diamond. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, yes, I'll, I'll go. And... This diamond's harder than steel. Blasted shutter might have chopped my hand off. Oh. 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 Uh, can't you... Can't you take your finger out? If I could take it out, why is your thick... Oh, it's just unfortunate, sir. That stutter is edged with a special alloy that'll cut through anything. If someone tried to smash through the window with a steel bar, the stutter would cut the thing in half. Diamond's too hard. A, a fraction of an inch either way, and there'd have been no trouble. A fraction of an inch either way, and I'd have lost my blasted finger. Uh, that wouldn't have blown the fuse. It's, it's the diamond causing the trouble. The drive motor's come to a standstill. It may even be burning at this moment. I don't care. The fuse is only rated for five amps. You see, uh, then put in a bigger fuel. It might work. It, if one could only open the shutter of a fraction of an inch. What? Oh. 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 Try 30 amps or more. Company fuses are blown. This this really is a short circuit. Telephone to power company. Tell them to send the electricians here immediately. Tell them it's urgent. That that's impossible, Mister Fassberger. The telephone isn't connected. Yet. No. We get we better take my car, drive to the nearest town, bring back electricians, engineers, fire brigade, anyone you like. But let's have some action. Don't you realize that I'm in dreadful pain? I can't get out of the house. There isn't any power to operate the doors and windows. We're sealed in, Mr. Fassberger. Then start the diesel engine. The, the 
diesel's outside. Uh, unless I can open a door, I can't reach it. No. Tell me, Mason. What do you propose to do? I asked you to build a house that couldn't be broken into. Not one it's impossible to escape from. I suppose the only thing to do is to try and force open the power company's fuse box. The point is that I haven't got any tools. The fuse box is sealed and you have to have a special star-shaped screwdriver. All I've got is a pipe scraper and a bunch of keys. Steel in my right hand trouser pocket. You will find a key ring with a small gold pen knife attached. Yes, I... I'll need light, too. It's practically dark here. It'll be completely black back, back there. In about my it. coat pocket, there is a gold cigarette lighter. You may use it. Yes, I... I, I... <sighs> right, then. I'll, I'll do uh, what I can. Do what you can. After several hours, when the strip of sky visible through the gap in the shutter was beginning to darken into night, it became obvious that Mason was achieving exactly nothing. No use, Mr. Fassberger. I can't make any impression at all on those screws. Not without the proper tools. So, what are we going to do? I don't know. I don't know at all. I can't stand here all night like this. This ring's almost cutting through the bone of my finger. In fact, my finger feels quite dead already. Uh, do, do you suppose... Suppose what? Well, it, it might be possible to cut through the ring. That would release your finger. But the ring's platinum. You can't cut platinum with gold. I could try very well. Bye. Uh, no, no good. Perhaps, perhaps if the diamond could be prized from its setting. Might be difficult. The diamond alone cost 2,000 pounds, and it was made with exceptionally strong claws to hold it. I wouldn't want to risk losing it. No, of course not. You can try. There is one point. There's a danger of dislodging the stone if I succeed in opening the claws. Danger? What off? Look, Mr. Fassberger, the house is completely sealed. If I should dislodge the diamond, you know, when I release your finger, the shutter would close and we'd lose even the quarter of an inch we have got. The house would become our tomb. It's already that, as far as I'm concerned. But we still have got the gap. Sooner or later we'll be missed and people will come for us. Huh? What do you mean, sooner or later? Two days, perhaps three. The people will miss me. Nobody will miss me, Mason. I'm a lonely man. Always have been. In that case, it wouldn't really matter if you were to die here in this house. No, it really wouldn't matter. Then what I don't understand is, why build the house in the first place? Concealed safe deposits and all those elaborate security precautions. Hmm? I have an instinct for certain things, Mason. And I know that the world's on the brink of what will be the worst economic crisis in history. Currency will lose all its value. Gold would be 
worthwhile investment if one could buy gold. But I settled for precious stones. I've sunk nearly all I've got into diamonds, natural sapphires, and emeralds. Four million pounds worth. When the crisis comes, these stones do not lose their value. They will increase. There isn't a bank in the country I would trust. So, I'll build my own bank. My fortress. You're shrewd. Very shrewd. But what are you going to do about your finger? I'd give 10% of all I have to the man who can solve this predicament. You mean that? 10 per- 5 percent. 4 million at 200,000. Can I rely on your word? Of course. But I reserve the right to, to revise my offer as the situation develops. But every day, I'll release it. Reduce it by 1 percent. You mean, you mean after five days, I get nothing? After five days, we'll both be dead. That night passed. And much of the next morning, too. It's not easy to sleep. Standing up. Finger going. Dead. Mason. You can't stand there. Through today and perhaps tomorrow like that with a dead finger. It'll have to come off. One of us will have to... Well, you see? Mr. Fassberger. All right. You'll have to use a small gold pen light. Blunt. It's all we have. Mr. Fassberger, I I couldn't. I In that couldn't. case, give me the pen knife. I, I can't. Let Mason, I... it's my blasted finger. If I want to cut it off, I'll blast it. We'll cut it off. Give me that knife. Yeah. Halfway towards solving the entire problem. Yes. Yes, indeed, you are. It's only a matter of time, Mason. Only a matter of time. <laughs> On the eighth day, Mason died. Fassberger, when he could bring himself to move from the corner in which he lay, hour after hour, day after day, watched for a sign of human life through the quarter-inch gap, his one contact with the world. Fassberger's hunger and thirst became obsessive. His hand was swollen and festering from some obscure infection. His tongue cracked along its surface. The ninth day dawned with monstrous dreams of food and drink. Oh. Yes, of course, Fassberger had thoughts of cannibalism. After all, nothing could hurt Mason anymore. But the millionaire dismissed the idea as soon as it entered his mind. Life, yes, but not on those terms. The ninth day passed. Fassberger, managing to mentally elbow thoughts of food and cool, clear water aside, pondered for a few lone seconds on the absence of any will. And then big pictures of venison and wine crowded back. And Fassberger, aware of little except late evening filtered sunlight, like a rod through the quarter-inch crack in the shutters, prepared to die. And then, suddenly... Just 
like that. Lifeboat at sea, arrival of the cavalry, nick of time, miracle, stay. Life and limb hanging by single thread, just like that. Will you have another sherry, Mr. Fassberger? Uh, thank you, madam. Thank you. I'm so glad I decided on a private funeral. Poor Harold would have hated the relations to have been there, especially his mother. He never got on with his mother. Isn't that strange? Mother and son. He with Harold. How oh, well. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I would like to uh, give you uh, something, Mrs. Mason. Your late husband and I entered into an agreement. It concerns... Sum of money. Two hundred thousand pounds. Oh, I have decided to sell the electronic house, Mabel. Have you, Julia? Yes. I have acquired a new sense of values. I sought security only to find insecurity and danger. My plans didn't really work. Life is not an investment, Julius. You can't really live in terms of profit and loss. In the long run, life is people just like you and me. Uh, yes, quite. Uh, so I shouldn't sell it. Don't think me a ghoul, but may I see it? The house, I mean, before you... Oh, I don't think I could... Just one small visit, a short one. I feel maybe I... Please. <clears throat> Very well. Um, the lawyers were prompt and thorough. Uh, the money, everything is uh, satisfactory. Oh, yes. Thank you, Julia. I don't expect the lady to fully grasp the intricacies of... Uh, oh, but I do. I understand perfectly. It really is a work of art. But it has painful memories for you. So I Yes, think... of course. Oh, Julius, I forgot. I want you to have this. Please don't open it now. Later. Hmm? Thank you. What is... Later. When you're alone. Oh, yes. Um, all right. Well, I just closed the shutters... Despite what happened here, despite the fact... Maybe? Hmm. Let's go now. Maybe, where are you? I think we'll leave now. Oh, one has enjoyed the usefulness of two hands for more than 40 years, living familiar with one hand. What? Maybe! When you read this, Mr. Fassberger, you will, if all goes well, be standing alone, 
in your electronic monstrosity. The house which became my husband's tomb. Always supposing I have managed by the time you read this to seal you in the house and cut off the power. I shall return in perhaps three weeks. Oh, I, I have a strong stomach, believe me. I shall destroy the letter you are reading now. Wherever you decide to hide it as evidence, I shall find it. You see, I love poor Harold, and I hold you responsible for his death. Therefore, I think it is only fair that you should share his fate. And, after all, no one will miss you, will they? Thank you for the 200,000 pounds. Goodbye. Mabel Mason. No. I'm... No. Beyond Midnight is presented every Friday night at half past nine by Biotech, the new soak and pre-wash powder. The program is adapted for broadcasting and produced by Michael McKay. That's it for the horror for this week. I'll be back next Saturday with another story. In between now and then, you can find more from Beyond Midnight, past episodes of this podcast, all the others, thousands of other old-time radio episodes, all at relicradio.com. While you're there, click on the Donate button or visit donate.relicradio.com. Check out the downloadable sets for certain donation amounts if you'd like to help support this and all of the shows. Your How It's Possible, thanks to those who have made it that way. Talk again next Saturday in another episode of The Horror. Tales of the strange and bizarre, the weird and the wicked. Stories not necessarily of the supernatural, but of the unnatural. Join us now for Strange Tales, featuring radio drama at its most mysterious and unusual. This week on Strange Tales, we'll hear from The Haunting Hour, series produced between 1945 and 1946, 52 episodes. It was first heard over NBC stations. Our story is from June 23, 1945. It's The Hands of Mr. Smith. the outskirts of a big city. In the black shadows, 
two men wait, their hats pulled down over their eyes, their hands tense in their overcoat pockets. Suddenly, one of the men leans forward in the velvet darkness to peer down the deserted street. I, I don't see him, Russ. He'll be along. I can hardly wait to get my hands on that dough. Yeah. Hey, look, Russ. My hands. The way they're shaking. Take it easy, Tiny. <laughs> it's funny. Every time I wait to stick up a guy, my mitts get shaking like this. You'll keep them paws under control. Oh, sure, sure. I'm not kidding. Oh, I won't do nothing. I won't touch the guy. Remember that. But why don't he come right? Get back here. But where is he? I can see the factory door, but he ain't come out yet. Get back here, I said. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> A car's coming. Cop. Huh? Police car. A couple of lousy cops. Shut up. But maybe they'll spot our car. Maybe they'll stop and start looking around. I said, shut up. Oh, look, they're going by. They ain't stopping. Stand still. Uh, they turned the corner. Oh, that's better. Gee, now my hands are shaking worse than ever. I told you to keep them big paws quiet. I'm trying to, Russ. The guy can't do more than that. Don't do it. When this cashier comes along, keep your hands in your pocket, and you won't be tempted. I remember. I won't touch him, Russ. Here he comes. Are you sure? That's him. He's all alone. He just came out of the factory. He's carrying some paper bag. He's got the dough in a paper bag. Uh, this is one trip to the bank he ain't never going to finish. Steady now. Okay, mister, get him up. Well, uh, who are you? Get him up, the man said. Take the bag, Tiny. Don't shoot. I, I won't yell. <laughs> he won't yell, he said. Take that bag, Tiny, you sap. I don't like this guy. Keep your hands down, Tiny. Give me that bag. I, I said I would. How much is in here? $3,000. 3000 <laughs> You punk. Stop. Get oh. it out, Tiny. Yes. But only 3000 he said. Stop. <laughs> I don't like him. Let go of him, Tiny. But I don't like him. He looks like that guy in the big house. Uh, I give you the money. Yeah, and I'm giving you something. Stop, Tiny. Let's go around like you're cold. Yeah, this guy won't stand still. Stop him. Let go. Okay. Okay. I'll let him go. You killed him. Huh? You killed him, you sap. He's dead. But he looked just like that guy that slugged me. Get in the car. They're going to leave him here? Get in the car, I said. Where's the door? I got it. Get in. Move. Address him laying there. Suppose them cops come back. Shut the door. We're getting out of here. This ain't the way to the apartment. We're not going to the apartment. Well, why not? I told Claire I'd bring the money home tonight. Keep watching that rearview mirror. There ain't no cops on our trail. But where are we going, We're right? in this car, you dope. Oh, yeah. Sure, we don't need this hot jalopy no more tonight. I thought I told you to keep your hands off that cashier. Oh, now listen, Russ. We had I... this stick up in the bag, but you had to go and scrag the guy. I didn't mean to kill him, but there was something about him. Once I got my mitts on his throat... I know, you can't make those big paws behave. I'm sorry, Russ. I had my rod on him. All you had to do was take the bag, get in the car while I knocked him cold, and we had smooth sailing. I said I was sorry, Russ. You're always sorry. But look. Look, we got the three grand, didn't we? We're in the clear. Nobody saw us. Nobody heard us. What do you mean, us? I didn't kill him. Hey. What's the matter? Back there. I think a power car just turned the corner. Well, is it? Uh, no. That ain't no prowl car. Just a black sedan like this one. They pulled up the curb. We'll turn off at the next corner, Brain. Plenty deserted around here. Why don't we stop here? Go on a little further along where it's darker. Yeah, Claire's gonna wonder what's happened. I said I'd be at the apartment by half past twelve. Well, no, soon enough. Yeah. Uh, wait till I show her the three grand we got. Uh, wait till she hears about the murder. Oh, I won't tell her tonight. No, she can read it in the morning papers. Hey, you know, we're getting kind of far out of town. When are we going to stop? Right here. I'll pull off the road. Okay. We'll leave her here. Yeah, that's a good spot. <laughs> Not even a house in sight. Uh, give me your gun, Tiny. My gun? Your gat. Give it to me. 
Well, but what for? To keep you out of trouble. Oh, now listen, Rush. Now, we're I... leaving this car. We're walking to the nearest bus line. If there's a cop on the bus and he looks at you twice, you're going to start shooting some uh... hand over your right. Okay, here it is. That's better. And now, Tiny, give me the money. Huh? The paper bag with the money. Hand it over. Hey, what is this? Give me the money, Tiny. Oh, sure. Here it is. Come on, now let's get out of this car. Let's go. Yeah. You're staying here. Wait, wait a minute. Keep those hands quiet. Hey, Russ, watch that gun. You're pointing it right at me. You said it. I'm washed up with you and so is Claire. What? Claire? Yeah, Claire, your wife. She's fed up to the teeth, so am I. You and Claire? Oh, so that's why you didn't drive the apartment. That's why you came way out here. You and Claire are crossing me up. I... You're figuring I'm bumping me off? That's right. Give me that gun. You bet I will. <laughs> oh, Rush, I'll get you for this. I'll get Claire and you if I have to dig my way out of my own grave. Gotta beat it, Russ. We gotta pack up and beat it out of here tonight. What? Well, at two o'clock in the morning, not on your life. We're staying here until this whole thing blows over. But that cashier. Maybe the cops have found him already. They're bound to find him soon. They're bound to find Tiny. Well, now, but Claire, they can't connect it up with you and me. I'm scared, Russ. Suppose Tiny wasn't dead. Suppose he drove the car back here to the apartment somehow. <laughs> you must believe in ghosts. He said he'd get us, didn't he? He said he'd get us if he had to dig his way out of his own grave. Oh, I shouldn't have told you that. Come on. Let's get out of here. Nothing doing, Claire. We're staying right here. Come on, baby. Unlock the trunk. The trunk? Sure. We'll hide the bell in your trunk until this whole thing blows over. Come on, honey. Unlock it. It is unlocked. Mm-hmm. This lid is kind of rusty, huh? There we are. I'll shove this three grand under all these clothes. Those are Tiny's clothes. Oh, come on. Relax, Claire. Now let me lock it. Hey! Come on. What's the matter? You've locked the trunk. Oh, Sure. But Tiny has the only key. He always carries it with him. Well, what about it? We'll get another one. I'll have a new one made tomorrow. What was that? Sounded like glass breaking. It was here in the apartment somewhere. Maybe it wasn't. I'm sure it was. Sounded like it came from the bathroom. Well, let's find out. Wait a minute. What for? Have your gun ready. My gun? That window in the bathroom. Maybe Tiny climbed up the fire. Oh, will you forget, Tiny? He's dead, I tell you. Come on. I'll find out what the noise was. There, you see? There's no one in the bathroom. The window's open. I closed it and locked it tonight before you and Tiny left. Oh, now listen, Claire. Look. Look, there on the window, sir. What's the matter now? Blood. Blood on the window, sir. Yeah. And here, on the floor, more of it. I tell you, Tiny did come back. He drove that car back here, climbed the fire escape, and he's hiding here in the apartment waiting to kill us. Quiet, right? Claire, quiet. I'm getting out of here. No, no, you're not. We'll go find down the street at this time of night. Some cop will pick you up as sure as my name's Rogers. But that blood on the cell, on the floor, the window open. Oh, wait a second. Oh, this cop on the floor. This isn't blood. Of course it's blood. No, Claire, you're wrong. Look. Look, look, look. There, under the bathtub. What is it? A bottle. A little bottle of that stuff you paint your nails with. I kept that bottle on the window, sir. All right, okay. So the wind, uh, something blew it off. That's what we heard. This bottle breaking. That's what made the spots in here. Listen. Police come. Sounded like it. Stopped in front of the bed. Come on out. Come on, what Suppose they followed Tiny here. Suppose he drove the car back here. Will you stop talking about Tiny... Put out the lights. What for? Put out the lights, Claire. All right. Peek under this window shade. See where that police car is. Are they out front? Yeah. Yeah, they are. Two cops in front of the building. What are they doing? They're, they're looking at a car. What car? A black sedan parked in front of the building. You said the car you used tonight was a black sedan. All right. There's a million black sedans in this country, Mike. But why are the cops looking at the one out front? Why are they putting their flashlights on the running board? Why are they looking inside? How do I know? Because Tiny drove it here. He isn't dead. You didn't kill him. 
He drove that car back here, climbed the fire escape, and he's in the apartment somewhere waiting to get it. Somebody at the door. What are you going to do? Open up. With a lot of blood on the running board. Blood? Yeah. All over the running board and a lot more inside. Well, what's it going to do with us? We don't own a car. You don't, huh? No. Maybe you know whose car it is, then. Take a look out the window. I already did. I thought you just got out of bed. I did. I heard the siren out front, came in the living, the living room, and looked out the window. I went back to put on some clothes to go downstairs and find out what it was all about. Who owns that car out front? I don't know. I never saw it in my life before. Hmm. Where's the janitor this joint? Janitor? Oh, no. Right. Well, Mr. We... Monks and his wife live in the basement. There's nobody home. Sometimes the monks stay overnight with Mrs. Monks' sister. She lives over in Glendale somewhere. Do the monks own a car? Not that I know of. Mm. Who lives in the apartment above this one? Uh, 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 let's see. Uh... An old bachelor. A man named Weaver. Maybe that black sedan belongs to him. We wouldn't know. Okay, folks. Sorry to get you out of bed at this time in the morning. That's no, all right, officer. I'll go up and talk to this Weaver guy. Uh, maybe that uh, stuff on the running board ain't blood, eh? It's blood, all right. Good night. Good night, officer. Good night, Weaver. That black sedan out front is the one you killed Tiny. Now, listen, Claire. Tiny didn't die. He drove the car back oh, here. Oh, I tell you, you're nuts. Tiny's dead. That car in front of the building only looks like the one I, I, I used tonight. Then how do you explain the blood on the running board? How do you explain the blood inside? I can't explain it. I can, because it's the car you shot Tiny in. He came back here. He's hiding in the apartment somewhere, waiting to kill us. He said he'd dig his way out of his own grave to get us. Oh, what a sap I was to tell you that. Let's get away, Russ. Let's beat it out of here. And leave that three grand locked in the trunk? Uh Uh-uh. Why did you have to lock that trunk? I told you Tiny had the only key. And I told you I'd have another key made in the morning. I heard it. Somebody's out in the kitchen. Oh, don't be a sap. There's no one in this apartment but you and me. Then what was that noise? I don't know. Probably the cat knocked over to something on the kitchen table. There he is again. I tell you, Tiny's here. And he's dead. He's dead. Do you hear me? In that car, two miles away. Wait. Where are you going? I'm going out in the kitchen. Don't leave me alone. I'm not leaving you alone. You're coming with me. Maybe you believe in ghosts. I don't. Come on. Look. Look, in the bedroom. Oh, uh... Can't be. That that's impossible. I knew it. I knew he'd come back. But it can't be. It can't be tiny. We're seeing things. Why doesn't he say something? Why doesn't he do something? Why does he just lie there on the bed? I'm going in the bedroom. No. Don't go near. I'm gonna get the key to that trunk. Don't touch him. Don't go near. But Tiny has the key. You told me I gotta get it out of his pocket. We'll get the money and beat it. He, he's breathing. I, I can't look at them. All right, steady now. I'll slip my hand in his pocket. I got it. I got the key. Hello, Russ. <gasps> Let go of my wrist. I said I'd come back, Russ. Let go of my wrist. Drop the key. Claire. Claire, get the gun out of my back pocket. A gun won't help you, Russ. You ought to know that now. You're breaking my wrist. Then drop the key. On the bed. Okay, okay, I dropped it. That's my pal. Claire. Don't come near him, Claire. Take the key, Claire. Don't come near him, I tell you. Pick up the key. Come around on the other side of the bed and get it. Yes, Tiny. You've always been a good wife, Claire. Take the key. The money we got tonight belongs to you. Tiny, with this money we can all get away. Sure we can. Pick up the key. Don't be afraid. All right. I will. Now. Stop! Let go of me! Now we're all together again. Your hand is breaking my wrist! We're all together again. <laughs> you and me and Russ. Russ! Why don't you do something? Yeah, Russ. Why don't you do something? I can't even move. 
These big hands of mine, they're better than a gun. They can hold you two here, maybe forever. <laughs> Well, but your new aircraft carrier has arrived. What? Oh, uh, put it over there next to the others, will you? <laughs> oh, and Jives, get me a Manhattan. The city or the drink, sir? <laughs> Good one, Jive. Wow, Mr. Farquhar, how did you ever get so rich? <laughs> Actually, it all started at the University of Guelph. Welcome, class of 72, University of Guelph. I have to do what to this fish? Fairchild, A. Farquhar, C. No, Judy, I gotta study tonight. Judy, no. And don't call me Fark. Farquhar, A+. Plus. Congratulations. You have been awarded the scholarship in marine biology. I have to do what to this mermaid? So, after graduating, I went into animal management. Flipper, Morris the Cat, all my clients. I owe everything to the University of Guelph. You could owe it all to the University of Wealth. Oh, Sparky. Frank Vatier introduces the 349 All You Can Eat Pizza. All the deep dish pizza you can eat as fast as you want to eat it. Fresh out of Frank Vatier's deep little pizza oven. No more waiting endless minutes for your pizza. You can have endless pizza in minutes. With pepperoni, mushrooms, peppers, deep dish the way you like it. Frank Vatier's 349 All You Can Eat Pizza. $1.99 for kids under 12. 4 to 10 p.m. limited time special at participating Frank Vatier's restaurants. And now the conclusion of The Haunting Hour on 104 Chum FM. Go on, Monk. Push the buzzer again. Ah, Dora, it's only 8 o'clock in the morning. The Smiths don't get up this early. We'll get them up. I'm going to find out about this. I'm going back downstairs and finish my breakfast. You are not. You're the janitor of this building and you're supposed to know what's going on with the tenants. Uh, that don't mean i got to wake him up and ask him foolish questions. I want to know if the man we heard about on the radio is our Mr. Smith. It can't be. How do you know? Go on, go on. Push the uh, button. We've had enough trouble last night over to your sister's house. Why are you looking for more? This ain't looking for trouble. If it was him, we got to know sooner or later and I want to know now. Uh, you sure got to be mad. I want to know, that's all. You never can tell the tenants. Who'd think that mild old Mr. Weaver was the kind to go out hunting wild animals? Ah, that's different. All right, all right. Stop the buzzer, monks. You've buzzed long enough to wake the dead. For crying out loud, Dora. This is a fine way to start the day. I have to... Try the door. Uh, uh... The door, monks. Go on, try it. Maybe it's unlocked. All right. Hey. It is unlocked. Well, open it. Go on in. Hey, I got the lights in the living room all turned on. I knew it. I tell you, there's something wrong with them things. <gasps> For crying out loud. Do you see what I see, Dora? Money. It's money laying all over the floor. They must have been storing that money in that trunk. Look, it's open. Yeah. Some money inside of it, too. But the Schmidt's never had so much money. Mm, as far as we knew... Ah, there was always something fishy about them, Smith. And their friend, too, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Hey, what are we going to do? <laughs> Someone in the bedroom. It, it, it don't sound like Mr. Smith. No. No, that's not Mr. Smith. Hey, come on, let's get out of here. Are you crazy? We're going to find out what's the matter here. We're going into that bedroom. No, 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 be careful, Dora. There's no telling who it is. <laughs> wait, wait. Hey, it's Mr. Rogers. Yes. What in the world happened to him? Listen. Listen to what he's saying. The car with blood all over it. That was Tiny's car. He came back. Oh, you must have seen Mr. Weaver's car outside with all the blood on it. You'd better tell that old dead that he's scared of the other tenants. None of our business if he wants to go off shooting wild animals. But to bring them home dripping blood, it's enough to scare the wits out of anyone. Blood was dripping. It was tiny blood. Uh, uh, now, now, Mr. Rogers, that was deer blood. <laughs> Mr. Weaver's upstairs went hunting yesterday. No, make them let me go. Make them take the cuffs off. Ah, uh, cuffs? Tiny did it. He clamped me to the bed. Uh, you're not clamped to the bed, Mr. Rogers. Your sleeve's caught in the rod at the edge of the bed. Monks, look at his hair. 
He didn't have white hair when he was here yesterday. Uh, what happened, Mr. Rogers? What happened to you? Tiny did it. He put his hands around her throat. Tiny did it. Oh, he's out of his head. Dora, it's, huh? it's true. <laughs> on the other side of the bed, Mrs. Smith. She's on the floor. Oh, maybe. Maybe she fainted. No. No, no, there's marks on her neck. Hey, Roger, <laughs> cut the act. Maybe you killed her. Tiny did it. With his hands on her throat, make him get off the bed. Make him get off the bed and open these cups. Make him get off the bed. There's no one on the bed, Mr. Rogers. Don't lie to me. I can see him. He's right in front of me, lying on the bed. But, Mr. Rogers, the bed's empty. The spread hasn't even a wrinkle in it. But I see him. I see him. It's tiny, I tell you. It couldn't be, Mr. Smith. Even if something was there, it couldn't be, Mr. Smith. It couldn't? No, he was killed. Police found him with four bullets in him. He was in a black sedan, they said. Uh, we heard it on the radio this morning. They found him dead about two miles from here. Yes, they described him on the radio, too. And we knew it was Mr. Smith. He died about half past twelve last night. Yeah, they, they said he had big hands. Like Mr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is, he had a key in his hand. A key? Yes, Mr. Rogers, a trunk key. A little trunk key in one of his great big hands. <laughs> From shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination in the haunting hour. That's our strange tale for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find more from The Haunting Hour, Strange Tales, and everything else Relic Radio at the website, relicradio.com. Thousands of old-time radio episodes to listen to there, and a shoutcast stream with even more. You can donate through the website as well if you'd like to help support this and all of the shows. Thank you, as always, to those who have helped out. Thanks for joining me today. Talk to you again next week with another episode of Relic Radio's Strange Tales. Strange Tales.